Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, for we're going to have a joint meeting right now of the Newcastle Town Board and the CCSD Board of Education. So, Town Board, can we have a motion to open the work session? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Do you guys need to do anything? I don't think so. All right. <laughs> um, so, I thought we, we have a special guest coming. Is that right outside? Yeah. Okay. Wait, wait. Before they come, I thought let's just go around and just introduce ourselves because we may not all know each other. So I'm Lisa Katz, town supervisor. Go this way. Ali Shoutow. Holly McCall. Brian Kelsey. Matt Auerbeck. Alyssa Dorfman. Kaylee Wong. Christina Ekman. Diggy Tip. Jeremy Slab. Hilary Grassack. Jim Carroll. Jill Shapiro. Sorry, I have a one month old grandson that I'm going to be able to see. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we, since we're a joint board and there is the Chappaqua Children's Book Festival coming this weekend, we have a special guest visiting us today. <laughs> Yay! Yay. Yay. Turn away for the camera. Hi. Yeah, turn the <laughs> and I know, uh, I think we were going to try to get a group board picture with Clifford. That'd be good. And I think Joanna is the expert time. <laughs> so while we do that, um, Lisa, you want to say a few words? I mean, it's the 10th anniversary. We really it's want to thank Town of Newcastle for being such an amazing partner all these years. So if there's something. Uh, sure, I'm going to say something on Saturday, but uh, we are very excited. It's going to be the biggest and best one yet. Um, one thing I know that Festival is very proud of is they're also sponsoring books that have been banned um, in other states uh, and municipalities. So we are very proud that we adopted a resolution against book bans uh, because we don't believe that anything should be banned. Um, and uh, we're very excited. Everyone should come out. If you don't know about this and you have kids, you should know and make sure to bring them out on Saturday, I think starting at 10 a.m. 10 to uh, 4, right be there. in the uh, train station here in, in the Chappaqua Hamlet. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Love to take a, if you all just want to stand up with yourself. Sure. 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 I'm not sure Clifford's that mobile, Jeremy. I'm not sure. Do you want to do it by the, the, the town of the sign, the, the in there, wherever, you, you know, the town of Newcastle signs? Is it signs? sitting around the table? Is your, uh, like a it, it, it's up to you. It's up I to think you. we should all stand around Clifford because then Clifford's going to be somewhere going to be really far Set yourselves away. up and I'll be there. Yeah. Clifford Come on, the Clifford. End. Okay, Clifford. Clifford, see? Sorry, Clifford. Probably not. He's going to be here, here. Okay. 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 Right there. Does everyone want to come around Clifford? Sure. You can, do you want to stand? Because like, okay. you can guarantee Dawn Greenberg is going to be plastering this up, thanking town of Newcastle and the support of, of, of so many. So just fantastic. Why don't we put Clifford and everyone take two steps back so we don't have all of this in the foreground? <laughs> <laughs> I forgot for a second. I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, ready? Okay. Okay. okay, we push in. I want to make sure I can see you. Here we go. I keep, Alyssa, yeah, you're, you're going to put yourself in the warm. I'm going to say, Lisa, Lisa, make sure I can see you. All right, now we're talking. Here we go. Smiles, Cliff, you want to put your arms up, maybe, or something? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and open your eyes, Clifford. Yay! Arms up, Clifford. Fantastic. The gentleman behind Lisa, a little to your right. There we go. Here we go, everyone. Fantastic. Have a great board meeting, guys. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you, Clifford. We'll see everyone we'll on, see Saturday. on Saturday. Saturday, yeah. train yeah. station. Everybody should take a book on Oh, it takes oh, some okay. Okay. Share them widely. Right. Thank you so right. much. See you guys later. Bye. Bye. All right. Well, that was fun. That doesn't happen every meeting. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, we thought we wanted to kind of use this, you new board members, we, you know, wanted to use this as an opportunity to kind of get both boards together because we are one, basically one community. And uh, I know we all have the best interests of, of everyone in our community at heart. So we thought it would be great to just meet. I know there's a few new um, Board of Education members. Um, just sit down. There are a few things on the agenda you guys have seen, but really just to meet, talk, and get ready to work collaboratively together. So we're excited to meet with all of you. Should we just jump right in? All right. So the first thing, and, and certainly everyone jump in when you want to, uh, the first thing we had is the um, discussion of the electronic sign IMA. So that never got finalized. So I think last time we were on it, it's new board members, the two uh, board of education members who were on the working group to kind of negotiate or no longer on the board. So you would need to appoint two new board members. But last time we discussed it, we were very, we were very close. I think one meeting and we can probably wrap this up if we can get our minds together. Uh, so I thought we could try to schedule that soon and get that done. And then it would need to obviously be approved by our full board and your full board. But if we could get you guys to appoint two new members to that working group and um, let's get it going. I really think one meeting we can just knock it out and be done. So the last time that we left off with the negotiation process, we were at the point where uh, in terms of our agreement, we were moving towards mediation. So I think our board would have to have a conversation as to whether or not we want to reconvene the team or um, move forward with mediation because that's where we were at the last point in this process. But I understand we have new members. So I think we have to have like a discussion about it before we commit to another date. Okay. My personal view is that it would be helpful before anyone went that step, which isn't even binding mediation. So I, I would rather have a meeting of the minds of all of us here. And I think we can do that. I think getting two new board members on that group to sit down and meet once or twice, I really do think we can just knock it out and be done. And I, I would urge you to just go that route first so we can just do it quickly without additional cost for either of our boards. Could you refresh my memory what the end date of the interim agreement is? Uh, it's the 29th of September, so we would have to extend it because we wouldn't be able to. Oh, and that's the time. That's this weekend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, I think the other problem that we were having with the working group is that there seemed to be oral agreement, and then what came back in writing was different from what had been agreed to orally. So can, if we meet again as a working group, can we try to have that not happen again? Yes, I actually don't believe it did happen. I think there was a disagreement among the attorneys, um, but we absolutely, what we discuss in the meeting, you know, sometimes what we discuss is not legalese. So when the lawyers get together and then put it into legal language, there's always kind of not changes, but there are always additions because language has to be written a certain way and we can colloquially say something, but in a legal contract, there's a certain way that contract attorneys write that. Uh, but yes, I think what we agreed to in the meeting, obviously the boards would need to go back and agree to that, but it absolutely should be able to be done. And maybe going forward, we could reduce a summary of what was agreed to before the lawyers started. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you guys can get back to us on that um, pretty mm -hmm. quickly, and we would um, certainly extend that so that we can meet, but I think if we could meet early October, um, or at some point in October, I think we can, we can finalize this pretty quickly. All right, uh, the next item on our agenda was a discussion of the proposed chat line. So I don't know if all of you know about it. Some um, those of us on the town board do, some of you on the Board of um, Education probably do. Um, what that is, and if I'm too simplistic and you know about it already, just tell me to stop talking. Um, but it's a proposed walking paved, some of it paved, walking path, basically from the end of North Greeley Avenue all the way up to Roaring Brook Road. 
it would be a way to connect the business district at uh, Chappaqua Crossing to the hamlet here in Chappaqua. It would also be a way to connect the Bell School to um, Horace Greeley High School because it would go past there. It's a way for um, the track team, for instance, to be able to run and run through down here instead of running on 117, which always drove me nuts when I saw my son doing that. Um, and it also is a fabulous way to kind of connect so many homes to the train. It's, um, you know, trails to rails. It has a lot of great benefits. And it's something we've been working on for a while. It would be very helpful to have um, the schools buy in for this. And certainly we are open uh, to any suggestions. It is a path that exists now, just not officially, that plenty of students use, plenty of kids are on there. It's unsupervised. So this would also be a way to make sure there are cameras, there's blue lights, it's the police are gonna um, be looking at it, you'll have more people. So it would be a way to make sure that actually it's utilized appropriately as well. Um, so we had, a, I know you had mentioned, um, Christine, that mm -hmm. there you wanted to look at your security. So we had, um, we have the chief here as well to answer any questions. Jill, did you have anything else you wanted to say? No, we don't just, uh, the security concerns were mentioned to us, but they've never actually been identified. I'm not seeking to have any, you know, state secrets revealed at this meeting, but if there are concerns about security, um, I had asked the chief and he was not aware. So if there are security concerns that the board has, we would very much like to hear about them. Um, happy to do another meeting, but we just wanted to be very clear about the path of the chat line, which actually at this point does not go on school property at all. Mm -hmm. It actually connects to Roaringbrook Road. We would then take and construct a sidewalk that would run um, from Roaringbrook Road up to um, the intersection with Chappaqua Crossing, where there already is a uh, a signal in place and crosswalks. So basically creating a trailhead down at uh, Warring Brook Road um, and encouraging uh, kids to, you know, basically not be driven anymore to get out of their cars and, and walk to school. They can ride their bicycles to school. Um, it's going to allow for non-motorized transportation to go up there. And, uh, we're, you know, we're really hoping that people are going to use it to commute downtown. That last mile has been um, a significant target for Metro North and um, other transportation uh, agencies to try to get people to their homes and keep them out of their cars. Um, and in light of climate change, it just seems like, um, you know, just such a reasonable thing to do for our future and uh, to get the kids just out of their cars, get them walking, get them riding their bicycles and providing them with a safe venue, avenue to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we really love um, your support of this is because we're looking for grant funds in order to fund this because it's not an insignificant cost and our application would be strengthened if we had the support of the school board. Can you remind me how the parking would change on the Chappaqua Crossing side? Like, was there going to be added parking spots? Yes, so there's going to be a trailhead there. Um, yeah. Okay. The town yeah, owns yeah, property down the hill. Right. Um, on if you're going down the hill toward the train tracks, it's on the left, but past all the houses. It's sort where, of right where it bends. But there's oh, already yeah. like a indent. Yeah. 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 Right. So, so there's the, the trail had to the twenty twenty five cars. That's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. When you're talking about kids using it to access school, but Bell really have, has it changed that kids who live near it are going to actually be able to access it now because I thought there were no access points between the endpoints. That's really um, up to that neighborhood. If they want to have an opening in their neighborhood, we're not going to, we're not mandating that. It, that's up to, up to them if they want and, to. And it would be controlled. It would not be, they would have um, a key fob or something like that that would give them access um, because obviously don't want people right. just exiting no. the trail. Anywhere. I sort of assume that, but yeah. mm -hmm. otherwise there are very few people who actually have access. Like it seems that that way, like we've talked about properties that would back up to the trail. And what Holly's saying is we, we, they would have an option, something we talked about, whether they would want to be able to access the trail from their property. And then 
having the fence set up in a way where they would only be able to access it on their side and mm -hmm. not you sound like you're actually there are a lot of other kids direction. who live down here who would be able to walk as well um and it would not just be kids obviously it would be anyone who wants to do that commute and most important and we've heard this from a lot of parents is to have a safe place for track teams and other sports teams to be able to run the cross country when they're not on, on the track i just um, uh, i gotta safe. clarify we don't have kids running on 117 anymore we, i know okay. and they've we bust them off campus or they run on campus so i just i wanted to i know that but okay. you know you know, I talk to Christine all the time. People don't always understand the difference between the town board and the school mm -hmm. board. So I've actually gotten many complaints, which I did forward to you, about why, why are you making the kids run on for cross country on school grounds? Mm -hmm. And I said, that is not my decision. I'll give you Christine's phone number. But um, yes, but I, you know, certainly for cross country, it would give them the opportunity to actually run greater distances. And it's an opportunity to make it safer mm -hmm. a paved trail with lights with police officers on bicycles routinely patrolling the area if, if the children are already using it and then we'll call it you can see the head mentor and your son is yeah on there sometimes mm -hmm. yeah you know it would give i think a lot of people <laughs> peace of mind to know that call boxes cameras, yeah. Just, yeah. you know only egress from there's a lot it's, it's so, highly it's, used right now it's just I yeah, I would, I would also say, oh, sorry. yeah, I would also say it's not only for the kids, but, you know, being in the suburbs, we live a more sedentary life and for instance, people in the city and it would be really good health wise for, for everyone to be able to, to take a walk, especially a walk to go somewhere as opposed to just a walk around the neighborhood. Yes, connecting yeah. the neighborhoods. I and there are a lot of neighborhoods. I don't children of that age group anymore, but I remember the days you'd go to the parking lot here in town and you have kids riding in circles, riding in circles, and it's mm -hmm. not the most scenic spot to ride in circles. <laughs> <laughs> or, or avoid cars for that matter. Uh, I think that line would be a great tool and, and, and uh, asset to have people very easily going back and forth, and you could theoretically go grab the, the bike somewhere in the, in the hamlet and shoot back up, or vice versa. Uh, go to Whole Foods and shoot back up, but it just gives you that safe, more scenic place to do things outdoors. Where do you pick it up on this end? North Greeley. You could pick it up on either end. Right, right. I spent oh, the end of North Greeley. Okay. So if you just go straight, so you'll be there and then up by on Warren Brook Road. And there are, you know, um, to your point, there's a lot of, there are a lot of neighborhoods up there, at least up near Chappaqua Crossing. There's Lawrence Farms East, Lawrence Farms South, there's Cowden Lane. There's a lot of neighborhoods that actually can connect safely to that, to that um, trail. Well, I so think it's people who are housing Chapel Crossing. And Chapel Crossing. Cross. So um, for us, if I, I'll speak for myself, just for the admin team. So some of the benefits of it, of course, we'd be using it for our PE classes. We have a mountain biking unit, and then we probably could have our track team out there and our cross country team. And um, we uh, also, it's additional like spot for people during high traffic events that like another pocket that maybe people would use to park there and then there'd be that sidewalk for kids to walk up to school right now mm -hmm. it doesn't exist um some of the concerns just in general because we've had a few audits then we, we'd have to do some stuff to the back of Greeley um and then just um like increased traffic during arrival particularly I don't know if it would impact that or not so that's just something that I've been thinking about, and then um, it would be problematic if there wasn't enough parking there and people tried to start parking at the Ed Center to, to use it. So those are some um, just some things that I I'm just thinking about in terms of our process. A letter like this would probably have to be approved by board resolution, and so you'd have to have like a two two meetings, a discussion. People could come and comment, and then a uh, resolution to approve a letter to support it on behalf of the community. So that would just be our process. So our, our like next step would be a, a public discussion on it at one of our meetings if the board wants to place it on the agenda. And we're happy if you want to do kind of a more fulsome presentation, our, you know, the, the consultants we utilize can come and, and really present with pictures and, and everything if yes, you want to seem, do that at a board I think that would be a lot of very helpful for you guys. I mean, it's up to you, but mm -hmm. I think so what is, if we were to go ahead and do this, as Christine explained, it's a two-meeting process. So mm -hmm. What is your 
time frame, just so we know what we're we're working with. I think we're as soon as possible, as soon as possible. <laughs> The TAC grant funding um, deadlines have not been announced yet, but we expect them to be. Um, and that usually is end of September into October, so we're just sort of waiting for that. But certainly, your, your letter would be tremendously welcome in this process. The proposals that we've gotten, how long does that you know, project take? I mean, that, that seems like a really encompassing project that could be lasting three years, five years? Well, it would be done in phases. Mm -hmm. It's not going to get done at once. Mm -hmm. and yeah, it's a multi-year project. Yeah, but there are there are nature areas in there, bird watching, things like that. So we would probably do that portion first and then connect. So we would try to make it as as amazing. I think for me, I'm I'm very visual in my learning. Um, I'm trying to picture this in my head, and I can't see where it starts, where it ends, and what's happening in between. <laughs> so I I would love to to see the renderings or whatever sure. you have. Yeah. I think we should definitely have them do a presentation mm -hmm. so for them. Um, and, and I think it would also be helpful for, like Christine had some educational ideas. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when they look at the presentation, there may be some other ways that they could make suggestions that could even in, improve the educational aspects of it. Right. So if you want to let us know at board meeting that would be appropriate, we mm -hmm. can talk to the consultants and then have them Lisa, know. do you have any resident pushback? Or any other entities that are in opposition to this, and what are you doing about that? So, we would you can talk to that. We haven't had much resident pushback. I, there was somebody who was not happy with it. They no longer live here during COVID. They moved, but um, we're trying to reach out to some of the. There are five homes I think that would border the. Um, the trail and we're actually seeking easements potentially from them if they want to give them but Jill's been meeting with them if you want to talk right to so um, I've been meeting with the five property owners um, whose properties actually abut uh, the chat one um, we don't need any private property to be able to build this it's just a matter of um, if we go through private property um, there's already a path there from when the uh, Westchester County um, repaired their sewer trunk line um, there's a huge trunk line. So, and they, they already, Westchester County has an easement for those properties. For those properties. Um, but so it would make it a grade trail as opposed to an elevated sidewalk, uh, an elevated boardwalk. So if we go through our private properties through wetlands, so the project takes a little bit longer, it's a little bit more expensive, it's a little bit noisier for the neighbors just because you're doing pilings and you're doing a, a raised boardwalk as opposed to being able to uh, just put some sort of asphalt over an already existing grade crossing. Um, the um, the areas, the neighborhood of Lawrence Farms was very concerned about having a public access through their property. We're not putting a public access through their property. That was their their request. Those five, one of those five property owners uh, wants a private entrance. They're welcome to it. That's a standing offer that we have. We've also you know offered to purchase. A portion of their property again that's their choice we don't we don't have to go through their property it's an option we're giving them and there'll be a fence and screening right, so, so it's really yeah what about chestnut oaks if they... so chestnut oaks we actually have an easement that runs through chestnut oaks we are not using it um we are instead um, um in the midst of obtaining an easement from metro north to go behind the um fence at chestnut oaks between the fence and the railroad tracks. And we're basically going to carve out a 10 foot um, easement that will allow us to create a um, just a grade level path that takes us behind chestnut oaks and around. So I think the the long and short of it is there's not really a lot of okay. opposition and it's been addressed proactively yep. concerns. Mm -hmm. But no doubt will be like anything else is going on. Of course, and, and, people and, don't like yeah, construction I mean, behind them. They, you know. Absolutely, I, I think some of the concerns with Chester Oaks folks is you know, they don't want 25 cars parked in their in their community for people to just hop on and hop off. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those 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 issues will be obviously addressed as best we can with enforcement and other issues should it come to fruition. Hopefully, when it comes to fruition. And there were questions about lighting. Is it going, you know, for the bordering properties, is it going to light them up? So we were able to address that. There are lights you can utilize that actually just shine down. Um, so we've been in discussions for a while with all 
stakeholders around there and have changed the plans to in order to uh, accommodate that. This has been going for a good half a dozen years at least, right? At yeah. Least. It was the toughest one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when I when I recall, it started the objections that I saw. I wasn't on the town board, but the objections really related to the possible takings of property when people just weren't sure whether um, you know the chat line had to go through private property and through Chestnut Oak property mm -hmm. as well. But that's you know obviously no longer on the table. It, yeah, it's generally mm -hmm. very like individual personal concerns and not like a. Community. an organization within the community that's right. concerned. So of the trail that exists right now, how much usage is it getting? I know it's not a really an official trail right now, but are kids on it? Are people on it every day? I mean, do you know? Kids are on it. You might want to check it out. I've never been. I didn't know where the beginning it began and ended. So yeah, but that's part of the problem. It can't be monitored because it's right. not an official trail. So we we don't know. We do know unofficially that kids are on it. Because um, you're on it that, unsupervised. That's, it's Biking. unsupervised, so it's you know. dangerous. They're not. On, they're not behind really. That's overgrown, and it's it's over by the track area. That's where the kids. There's a path back there that. That's where they go. Right. Hopefully, this will keep them off of that. Mm -hmm. So, if you are amenable to it, I think we should have that presentation. I think it'll answer a lot of questions, and you'll see for the visual learners, you'll see the pictures, and you'll see the map where because I'm a visual learner also, so I, I'm with you. Um, and you'll you'll see where it's going to go, what it's going to look like, and it's 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 really I think a fabulous uh, would be a fabulous amenity. I agree. Okay. All right. All right. Guess next. Um, oh, so did you have anything you wanted to talk about with the chief on the chat line? Are you going to wait until? All right. Um, field and facility usage fees. So that's going to be a much longer discussion than just for today. But we just kind of wanted to put it on your radar and flag it for, for future discussion. We are one of the only municipalities that actually pay the school, their school district for use of fields. Um, not including, obviously, janitorial staff for, for, um, for events and um, anyone who needs to clean up spaces. Uh, but we're one of the only municipalities that does that. And it's a significant amount of money, uh, especially with regard to um, our camps, um, as well as, you know, the bad use of a basketball um, for, our, for our basketball program, um, our youth basketball program. So I wanted to put it on the radar. This is something we would really like to talk about if there is a way that we can reduce and or eliminate <laughs> these fees um, other than out-of-pocket expenses, obviously, for overtime for anyone who needs to be in indoor facilities or outdoor facilities. And ultimately, you double dip in the resident. The resident's already paying taxes, most of them, not all of the school district, but at the same time, it's not likely that someone who's all in the West End is going to come and walk the track or walk use a facility if they have other facilities on that side or, you know, not that they won't or can't, but not as likely. So most of the people that are likely using the facility are going to be mostly Newcastle slash CCSD residents. Um, so it's, it's a lot of money. To your point, Jeremy, also, I know that, so there, there are C CCSD students who are not part of Newcastle. However, we allow those students to utilize our rec programs. So it's really going to be the same people. There's never going to be uh, an opportunity where, where the taxpayers of CCSD are not able to utilize um, those programs. So it's, it's the same taxpayers. Right, and, and right now, actually, CCSD charges uh, $51 per participant if you're a non-CCSD um, resident versus $16 a resident. But the question is, are being those, that $16 fee is being charged to someone who already pays CCSD taxes, those would be Newcastle. 
you know, for instance, for our TOTS camp this summer, we paid about $17,400 for use of Graflin for our TOTS camp, which are the, yeah, little, the little ones half day. Um, so, and during COVID, it was too expensive to run Camp Adventure at one of the elementary schools. So we ended up permanently moving Camp Adventure, which is kindergarten through fourth grade to Amsterdam Park. But Amsterdam Park does not have the infrastructure to maintain regular camp programming. There's not even a bathroom. We incur an extra fee because we have to rent a trailer bathroom every summer. And an additional issue is that there's no indoor space. So for the last two years, anytime there was a storm, and if you recall at the beginning of the summer, it was constant rain. Every single time we were expecting a rainstorm, parents were getting a text, got to come pick up your kids. There was a few times that the town was able to bus Camp Adventure to chat pack for a movie, but you know, we're not, I mean, my, my children, all, all three of them utilize parks and recreation program and all three of them go to town camp. I wasn't paying to send my kids to chat pack for a movie every day during summer camp, right? And the fact that there wasn't an indoor space for working parents too, you were getting a text, with, got to pick up your kid within 20 minutes. My office is in Yonkers, it's not possible. So, you know, it's... it's I think it's, that just, I don't know if we have ever spoken about this before, but what's coming to mind for, at least for the summer, um, it would be nice to have an indoor facility that you could use, but I'm thinking about the problems we have already towards the end of the school year and the beginning of the school year, having to put our heat alleviation plan, you know, in place because it's just too hot. And I don't know how hot it's going to be inside when it's right in the middle of summer. So that's something also to consider. Um, but yeah, I mean, but th there are things that need to be discussed and just, you can't make a decision here, but. What we have, a, when you use our facilities and when outside facilities groups use our reserve our spaces, we have fees that we incur for that, for all kinds of things. So if you want us to relook at this, then we need to have a better idea of your cost and we have to analyze our cost and we have to work with the policy committee to see if it makes sense to make an adjustment that would be approved by the board. So. Um, we can certainly look the policy committee meets all year long. So if you give us some information to look at, I can pull Joe Bermano in with Josh. We can look at um, the expenses incurred because you're using our spaces and we can we can have a discussion as to whether or not it makes sense to make an adjustment to these prices, which we haven't changed um, since we moved to this model in 2018. So I think they've been the same. Um, well, they just but went I think out. the when larger it, question is not should we reduce fees, but do we need to have fees at all? Right. And I Other would, than yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Expenses. So I think what we need to do, not at this meeting, because we're not ready to do that, of course, is talk about what are our expenses when you're using our spaces. Mm -hmm. I think that was, I think we had done that when we came up with this originally. I, I feel like if we do an anal another analysis of it, costs have gone up for us. So I don't, you know, but we're not prepared to talk about that today, but we certainly can. If you give us information to look at, we can <coughs> policy committee could have a better conversation around um, what what we feel makes sense for us based on what you feel like you need. The only okay. one, one, one small piece of pushback I would just say is that when you say we use we are using the facilities, it's not we, it's it's your same student body that's using the facilities. It's not as if it's out of town people coming in, out of school district people coming in and using facilities. It's still the same students, the same constituency, probably the overwhelming amount, hence that's why you can see the difference in price per at a, at a non resident and, and just school district resident. So that's, I hear what you're saying. It's just we don't budget for it. So, like, if, you, if we're going to incur the cost of you using the facilities, our kids using the facilities for you, your organization, then we have to budget for that to support it because we right now we don't. So, that, that's like another layer of this. So, a conversation earlier rather than later is really important for us. Yeah. So, thank you for being one other thing that I'd want to just understand is you're talking about rec program, right? Mm -hmm. Like Newcastle rec program, because mm -hmm. there are also private sport groups. Like what we don't want to happen if we look at this is that suddenly magically all sports groups become rec groups. Like there are right now, there are 
Newcastle Rec leagues or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then there are many other outside mm -hmm. sport organizations. Um, it can't, if we would change the policy towards Newcastle Rec League, it would not necessarily change the policy towards mm -hmm. outside. I think that's totally yeah. sporting. Yeah, that makes that's sense. Fair. That's totally fair. But I guess what, what we're saying is that it couldn't be then that instead of there being these divisions that those suddenly became subsumed into. Right. You understood. understand what I'm saying? Understood. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is traditional programs that Newcastle Rec has always run. Our basketball programs always run. She said if I started my own cooking class, I could have been go to the town and have a school. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> just so but I would definitely sign up for your cooking class. <laughs> just so all intrigued. It's <laughs> that. So when you say town and Newcastle programs, are you talking about lacrosse, baseball, soccer? Is that what you're talking, talking about? about programs because that's field usage as well. Right. Our so because we schedule directly with them. Yeah. And so the problem becomes, which is why this is much more complicated, is there's certain programs that have been tried yeah. to get recognition by the rec department who haven't been able to. So then all of a sudden we're charging them a fee. So this is this is like this is a much bigger um, conversation for us because mm -hmm. we have to be fair. It's a, the camps a lot easier than the field use, quite frankly. Maybe um, we can. Um, mm -hmm. Bifurcate them. Yeah, but it is a yeah. We could bifurcate. It's a good idea, but it is. I agree. A larger discussion mm -hmm. and something that that's why I kind of bringing it up today is that it's on our radar and we should discuss it. Obviously, understanding no one's really prepared to do that. I think but we do pay just janitorial janitorial mm -hmm. staff. We already pay that, and that's something we absolutely would still want to pay. I think it's also An important expected to just um, note that. And I don't think any of you think this, but just to re remind everyone that the school's not charging. It's to me, it's pretty nominal for what it is. Um, we're not charging to make money, obviously, just to really cover the cost. And if we would love to join hands and and do what we can, but I think it makes sense. Like Christine said, we need to look at it mm -hmm. because the field usage it is very complex. You know, I have kids in all different sports and all over town town, you know, fields, school fields, sports. Um, again, you know, camp is one thing, but indoor usage again in the summer, I don't even know if you want that. So that might be something to- Well, consider. I think Camp Adventure is going to stay in Amsterdam yeah. Park, but we're, you know, talk camp, yeah. talking about our youngest then, residents. And back to the original, the reason we did a per participant fee is because we needed to hire a secretary to schedule all the teams because that wasn't working for you and it wasn't working for us and it wasn't working for like the whole community. So we had to take that on and we couldn't just pay for that out of our budget because it was for the recreation program. So that's what that cost primarily offsets in addition to some like field maintenance issues. Um, so it, listen, it's a big conversation. This was not done casually. This was done after a lot of thought and consideration and to make a shift, there's a lot of different components of it that need to be analyzed before you do that. Okay. I just think that there's a, a when you take a look at it, you'll see that there's a difference between the field usage and your assignments and the indoor basketball program and badminton program, which, um, you know, are overwhelmingly used by CCSD families, mm -hmm. um, still being charged additional fees for it. And the whole idea that, you know, when custodians are there cleaning um, during the week, that we're still paying or additional charges, even though, even if we weren't there, they would be there. So let me ask you, would your fees go down if we waive the fees? Yeah, we, we, we pass these on. So you, you would lower your fees to yeah. the residents? Yes, yeah. yes. And the users? Yeah. And, you know, one example comes to mind about accessibility. We had such an overwhelming interest in youth basketball last year, and so many children got shut out because we didn't even have the court space, right? We were only allowed access to maybe one or two school gymnasiums. And so I fielded a lot of complaints about that. But at the end of the day, there's nothing we could do, right? We don't we don't have the we don't have a rec center, we don't have indoor basketball courts, unfortunately. But it pains me when community members have to seek athletic programs outside of the community. We want to be fostering our recreation programs, we want to be supporting our parks and rec department. And I think there is opportunity here to to work together on this and make sure that everybody who wants to play basketball in the winter has the option to play. 
with their friends. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, future budget and staffing SLEs. We just wanted, well, we wanted to know whether or not, in light of the fact that the, the chief is in the midst of um, hiring right now, to be able to accommodate um, the additional staffing for the SROs, which we're happy to do. Um, as we prepare our budget for next year, um, we need some advance notice, whether it be for cars or additional staffing, to know whether or not the SRO levels at this point are going to. Do you predict that they're going to stay the same, or do you expect that there are going to be additional SROs that are being going to be needed, just so that we have an idea as to, you know, yeah, start our budget process next week? Well, so there are many municipalities that are paying for SROs in schools. I mean, that's also, you know, the it's that's also something that's true and that, you know, we thought we were going to have a conversation about and then that conversation turned out very differently. But I think that the answer is we don't know. Um, as I've talked about a few times publicly already, there are a number of different ways that different communities are staffing SROs. Mm -hmm. um, we are actively advocating for some changes that would make the finances of it easier. Um, you know, as we talked about in that meeting, it would be helpful for that to be joint advocacy. Um, but there are also a number of programs, so I've been participating in a number of meetings, that there are differ, different thoughts on how to potentially make SROs more affordable to school districts. And we are hopeful <laughs> that some of that might come to fruition, but like we're just not in a position at this point to say what we might or might not want to be able to do or be able to do financially past this year or that you know the two years that we've entered into um for the two sros i don't think we can say anything definitively at this point beyond that so holly and i were in that meeting where we talked about advocacy and and i can't speak on behalf of the board but i know we were um, of the opinion that anything we can do to help you advocate to make the provision of SROs more affordable, um, whether it comes out, you know, isn't included in the tax cap, et cetera, we are fully amenable to, to helping and supporting that goal. So I can't speak for the rest of the board members. That's but that we should be at our, you know, just a letter, 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 that's right. Yeah, and we yes. would be happy to meet with our state reps, you know, yeah. assemblymen mm -hmm. or state senator. Um, well, I've been doing that, so. Chair, but, but, you know, I, I can tell you those efforts have been ongoing for years and years regarding school security. And uh, it's just a question of how targeted and how focused they are. Oh, I'm working on it. Among the uh, different <laughs> districts and different towns. <laughs> so, <laughs> my strategy, I've met with multiple legislators, and I, the strategy is asking for an exemption for this in, in the tax cap. And packaging it as not a, an exemption for SROs, but an exemption for security personnel. That way, it's not as um, political. Um, and so, I've met with three. I have one more I have to meet with before I like organize some a correspondence. And I met with my superintendent group. But anytime that you could advocate for the same in that way, I think is, is helpful because there's a consistent message. Um, because it's it, it it really is beyond the pale that some communities. School districts don't have to pay anything, and other school districts have to pay half, and other school districts have to pay the whole thing, and it's not, it's not, it's not right for communities. So my my position is just give us the exemption to allow us to budget for it, so I don't have to pull from the contractual side of the budget, which impacts the classes. So that's what I'm. That's that's our position right now. If there's some additional movement in a, in a different way, that would be great, but I, I, I'm not relying on that because that usually never bends in our favor in this school district. So are you only considering adding SROs if we're, if there's that change in the tax caps? I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around this too, like as a parent and someone who's obviously very, very involved in, in advocating for adding mm -hmm. SROs. I want to make sure that the message to the community is is what the expectations were in the spring because it was my understanding that the expectation was that we would be adding them to all of the schools 
And I've really pushed my, my colleagues on the town board to take a community stance on this. This is not just a school district's problem, this is a community problem. We have to work together to solve it. And I sincerely mean that it's important to me. And I know a lot of people agree. So I just wanna make sure that what's being related to the parents is in line with kind of where the survey results came out. And if there is something that we could do to help you advance that goal, we want to know now. <laughs> we want to know now. Like if that's if that's the bottom line. If we were to say tomorrow, yeah, we'll pay for all three. If that's what you guys are looking at, we want we want to work. With, we can't obviously take on the cost of three SROs, but we want to work towards creative community solutions. So if that's if the bottom line is either take it out of the tax cap or town board pay for all three of them, is is that are those the two choices, or are we open to working together on a solution? alternative solutions while we wait for this to happen in Albany, which could take years. And we have a tax cap as well, right. as you know. Right. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, but I, I, who do you think pays for it if the town pays for it? The same taxpayers. So whether it's coming out of the school budget or whether it's coming out of the town budget, the problem remains the same. Christine just spoke about the fact that it, you know, it's beyond the pale that the communities should have to shoulder this. It's the same community. Right, so, but it's not, I mean, you want to put percentages of budget? I mean, you really don't want to go there. Or maybe we do. I mean, I think okay. like that it is a difference. Yes, it's coming out of a budget, and yes, it's the same taxpayers, but I, I think that it is more complicated. There are plenty of municipalities where the town budget is where the SROs are funded through. There are also uh, school districts that are hiring retired police officers as SROs who are still fully trained SROs but are getting all of their retirement and other benefits from their previous job, the one they've retired from, so that they can be 10 month employees, so that they can be, um, frankly, cheaper employees because you're not paying benefits and not paying uh, retirement. So we were told that wasn't an option and yet it's an option in many other school districts. So that's another Chief, possibility. Do you want to speak to that? County? Yeah. Can you name one? Oh gosh, I was on the call. I don't remember. I don't want to speak for a district, but it so, was a. It, so, so we're bound by the Worcester County Police Act, and I have a collective bargaining agreement with my um, PBA, which would that those things would happen. Okay, but and, I. And I, you, I know you say that there are municipalities that give two municipalities that pay for the their SROs 100%. 100%. Uh, so in, yeah, in Harrison. Yeah, I don't think you Where can there's see. another model in your town where they pay 90%. I think the mm -hmm. 70 30 seems to be a you know, the more common line. I, I think I want to go back to Ali's question because it's a pointed one and I, I appreciate it, but I, I can't answer it because I don't know where the budget is next year yet. And so to say, uh, and, and I under, like our data point last year from the community members who took the survey was very supportive in our faculty of having SROs in all six buildings. That is absolutely true. Um, but there's a lot that goes into building a budget, which is why the exemption advocacy is what I'm focused on right now because it allows for more flexibility in budgeting because right now I don't have it. So if you were to say, well, what are you going to do, Christine? How are you going to present the budget? Are you going to put six in? The answer is, I don't know. Because if that means increasing elementary class sizes because I have to pull from somewhere, there's going to be a whole other population of people that are going to be really unhappy about that. So I, I'm not But gonna, is that the only place that you're going to have to pull from? It's contractual. So it, it's, it's, the height, it's, contra it's the contractual line. It's not capital. It's contractual. So I'm trying to, so instead of like locking me into what do you plan on presenting, my suggestion to you is advocate in the way that I am to give us maximum flexibility to be able to do whatever we feel like we need to when we're budgeting and we're not constrained by the levy limit. Because right now, if I were to add, let's say, I, hypothetically, six police officers plus security, it's like $1.8 million, maybe, you know, around that. And that's a lot of money. When you have a levy limit, you've got to roll over increases to staff. And then I have to start cutting, which is what I needed to do this year to be able to support the two extra ones that we've took on. So I can't just plan for it and say we're going to do it without really having an understanding of the retirements. We've got three contracts out. Like I have work I have to do before I say this is where our position is. So the best position that we could be in is, it, is an exemption, and I could push the tax levy, levy up so it doesn't, it doesn't preclude me from adding it and pulling from somewhere else. So I'm not going to sit here and say this is what I'm presenting to the board because I don't know yet. But I hear you loud and clear. 
And I hear Hillary, and it is true that some districts get more support to do this financially from their town. But I also heard the town when we had a meeting saying that was not possible right now. So it, it's it's a real difficult position for us all to be in. And, well, and we that's also it. do pay a significant amount toward the SROs. It's not that we're paying zero. We're paying a significant amount toward those SROs, which maybe previously wasn't understood that we were. The other, the other issue too is that the students who are utilizing the SROs as part of the Chappaqua Central School District, some of those are actually not Newcastle taxpayers. So that is where there's a difference. Unlike the rec programs where we let, as long as they're in CCSD, we allow them to utilize our rec programs. Here you would have kids benefiting from an SRO, which I think they should, who maybe are not actually paying, they're paying Chappaqua school taxes, but not, you mean our not they're paying, students. right, they're paying Chappaqua Central School District taxes, mm -hmm. but not Newcastle taxes. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say what I said before. I, I, I think we all have the same interest, which is a safer community. And this is one mm -hmm. of the ways that we've identified to make it happen. So I, I think, you know, it's a complicated issue and the tax cap makes it hard for us for the same reason it makes it hard for you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think you're right. Let's let's figure out how we can all advocate and give you the maximum flexibility so that we're not worried about who's doing what over there and who's doing what over here and we can just, you know, achieve the goal of the safer community. Christine, the messages mm -hmm. that you're giving to the legislators who you're speaking with, mm -hmm. do you have to modernize so much so that we might be in a position to be able to mirror it when we speak? I have one more meeting, and then I'm going to write my letter, and okay. I'll send it to you. All right, that would be great. Because that would be helpful. It would be helpful. We will absolutely. 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 I, I just want to say, I appreciate all your advocacy work. I support it. If there's anything that we can do, or parents could do, to make more noise and to push for our legislators to do this, we'll let you know. Don't let worry. Let me know. I'm happy to do it. But I don't want do you have this. <laughs> I don't want I don't want this to be um, in the 11th hour in August after the budget. So by the way, you know, we could use some help. Like that's why we're bringing it up now, because if if I'm trying to be pragmatic, that may not happen now, next year, the year after. But this is still something that we have to do and should do sooner rather than later. So while we're waiting for our legislators to figure it out, like the whole point of me advocating for this position is because I got tired of waiting for our legislators to figure it out. Something that I felt we could do within our community now may not, God forbid, it may mean nothing, but I would like to, I sleep better at night knowing we've done everything that we can to keep our kids safe. While we're waiting for our legislators to do what they need to do, what can we, everybody in this room, do now to come up with a creative solution? Like Holly said, this is a community problem. We want to solve it together. So, you know, I don't want to wait till budget season has come and gone. Some feedback would be great. So then we could start looking at our numbers and be like, okay, you know, we could, we could figure out a way to help you guys. And maybe it's a little more give and take in terms of other things, you know? I, I, I think that theoretically, we've already said we all agree on yes. what needs mm -hmm. to get done. And on the one hand, it's a matter of, of numbers. I think it's just going to come down to numbers, your numbers and our numbers and what we could do to work that out together. Um, secondly, I mean, the reason we go to advocacy is because what we can do creatively is limited by the tax cap that we face on both sides. And I can tell you from my 10 years of experience with advocacy, what has been found to be most effective is if more than the Chappaqua Central School District or more than the town of Newcastle goes out and asks the legislature for help on something. Because frankly, we're seen as a wealthy district. Okay, so no one is really going to listen. That we, our legislators will listen to us, but we have to appeal to the entire legislature plus the governor, because without the governor, we're not going to get changes to the tax cap, and that seems to always be a third rail. So the the real impact is in joining with other communities, and that's what's been effective in advocacy in the long run with really difficult issues like funding the foundation aid and things like that that have been really tough nuts to crack. So there's no way we can do something uh, impacting the tax cap, just us alone. Right. I can tell you from experience and um, Hillary, I know you're involved regionally. I don't know if there's a focus now on security. There was a huge focus on it after Parkland. 
that still didn't move the needle, so I don't know what will. But at some point, you know, there is a point where you, you reach a tipping, you know, you, you tip the scale. I don't know where that will be, but I, I just don't think we can get to it alone. Mm -hmm. I have also, spoken just to that point with the town supervisors of all the towns in Westchester um, about this issue, and I think most, if not all of them, would be on board with, with trying to advocate to take this out. But that's what we have to do. Yes, that's what well, I, to I also yeah. want to say that I don't, and I don't I, I know that everyone who has spoken so far is in support of having an SRO in every building, but I don't I know if that's the reflection of the full board of education. So I do want to be fair and put that in the center of the table. And this is a pilot for us. And I think that's important too. Michelle is not. Um, clearly, we feel that Michelle's presence at the high school or an SRO is, is very important, but we're piloting with two other positions. So I just want to put that position out there. But I, I do need flexibility if we want, if the board decides they want to go further. And so that's what I'm trying to, um, that's how I'm trying to position us right now. But you did say that the, the feedback that you got from the community and from staff was overwhelmingly in support. So Yeah, you have those survey results. I sent them to you. Yep, I know. I saw them. But I, and I, I would go on the record, and mm -hmm. obviously I don't think I need to go on the record, but I will. <laughs> I am advocating for a right, I mean, if that's what the community <laughs> wants. I, I mean, think. even without the community, that that is my belief. Mm -hmm. But with the community, I think, you know. Well, and to Vicki's point um, about advocacy, so we have been trying to get consensus around this. I've been in, you know, not at, because they're all still on Zoom, which is its own level of infuriating, but <laughs> I've been on a number of meetings um, and the, the consensus is that something needs to change. Um, and this may be the easiest to get through in terms of it being tax capped exempt as opposed to somebody actually writing a check. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there is at least regional consensus. There is the, you know, the statewide um, advocacy. The statewide advocacy is always trickier because you learn very quickly, as I'm sure you all have seen too, that New York State is a collection of many states that do not necessarily have aligned interests. Um, although on more funding for security, whatever mechanism that takes, there seems to be agreement. Um, whether it's everybody's first priority or not is, you know, negotiable. I think for some communities where it's not um, and, and I'm not referencing anything local, but for some communities where it's not a school district issue to provide security, it's less of a hot topic because it's not their problem. Um, but I think that it's something that certainly is front of mind, we're working on. There's certainly, you know, I was on a, a MISBA um, webinar about school security for an hour and a half last week. So it's certainly like front of mind whether or not we can get them to change is obviously. So, I think we're sort of going in circles here in terms of where, where we're going. But one last thing I do want to add, people who may be watching our fans at home, um, <laughs> uh, is that what people have to understand is, is ultimately, if we hire new police officers and they revert back to the community because you ultimately do not want them as an SRO, now we're adding the full force, and I use that term financially, back to the community for getting three extra cars that you might be using that ultimately comes back to the community that has major impacts on our cap. We're a fraction of your cap. Not that you don't have the same issues, just on a larger scale. So I think people who are not in this room need to understand that I believe in good faith, we're trying to figure this out and work together to make it happen, but there are many pieces and it's not as if we're not saying, we don't want to pay anything, or you're saying, we don't want to pay anything, but there's just practical realities to all this. But uh, I didn't mean to take the stage and say we're going in circles, but I think the principles are for sure. Okay. Well, and that's not our intention in any way to be like, let's try this, and then, oh no, these are your police officers. I just think no, no, no. it may, who knows what happens out of That's what we're trying to get this through. All right, so soon we'll move on. <laughs> All right, the next, uh, there are just two quick things. The next one, school incidents. So I sent an email to the whole board um, of education and to Christine as well, that, you know, when there are incidents in the school, like a anti-Semitic, you know, hate crime, let's say, 
the school gets you you notify that school the the res the um parents of that the, the students in that school sorry um but it gets out in the community and i get phone calls about it and then it's like a giant game of telephone with students from other schools asking what's going on. They're asking me what's going on. I'm calling Christine. So I wanted the board to consider incidents, not every incident, but if there's something that rises to a level of import, I wanted you to consider notifying the town so we can match messaging and get that same information out there instead of not knowing and then miscommunication um, it has a much, it's much greater, um, sorry, there can be much greater miscommunication because something's going on and the whole community is not informed of what is happening. So it's something, and I know, um, I didn't hear back from the school board on it, but I did hear back from Christine. Um, I think, you know, the school could certainly put in guidelines. I know Christine, you're saying, well, it wouldn't, we wouldn't know when to say that. You could put in guidelines as to, as to when you would notify the town, but I really think it's very important. And the same thing happened when there was the issue at the school, you know, with the phone calls, swatting. with the swatting, and the school was notified, but the rest of the community wasn't, and except what I was able to get out there. But it's, it's a time when we all need to be working together to have consistent messaging to the whole community. So maybe I can speak to this. Um, many times in those more serious issues, Christine and I work together on the message that goes out. Maybe I can share that with the board going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, Swanee, we, we got some out as soon as we could. Right, no, 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 that I, I mean. But yeah, so maybe that's, mm -hmm. as long as Christine doesn't object, maybe I can do that. Please that I know. But just recently, I know there was a, there was a, a anti-Semitic incident at Bell and the Bell students families were notified of that but then I had Seven Bridges families and Greeley families calling me saying what happened and I didn't know and then I have to refer them to you and then it's they're trying to hear from their friends at Bell and it's a giant game of telephone and I think it would be much more beneficial to our community if we could have one point of contact and communication. It's something I just want you to consider for issues like that. It doesn't need to be for everything. There are obviously things you're only going to let the high school kids know, um, curriculum, whatever it may be, but but things of greater import where it comes to safety or discrimination and issues that really are, are impacting the whole community, I, I would urge you to consider um, letting the town in on that so we can have uh, a joint message or at least so we can disseminate your message in an appropriate manner. So we, our protocols are outlined in our code of conduct and this it took us a long time to figure out what was appropriate um, based on what we felt like we needed to do in, a, in our school community when, when children make mistakes. And so at this point, we wouldn't be able to add to our protocols because it would create a situation where the policy committee would need to meet. We'd have to do some work on our end, change the code of conduct and push that out to the community. But it's certainly something that we can talk about as we plan forward for next year. So does um, the board feel that way or is that your thought? No, it's right here in the code of conduct. No, no, but I, but with what I'm proposing now, I'm wondering, is it, is it <laughs> your opinion or has the board thought about it and discussed well, it? Well, the board approved the updates to the code of conduct and we, those of us on the policy committee made the adjustments to it for this year. So we're in favor of what's in the code of conduct. Well, I understand, but this is a new development. So is it something that you'd want to reconsider? Um, I understand that the policy committee would need to meet Just, again, but can to me, it's, it's a greater import. Does, does that policy include messages when you have to include Chief Carroll? Is that, is that, does, is, or is that a separate category? These, the code of conduct has real clear language of when we are to notify parents when there's an incident of hate speech, bias, and or discrimination, okay? There are times where we send out notices 
to buildings because something occurs and it's so disruptive that we need to let parents know that we've addressed it. That goes beyond hate speech. And so often those are when I'm working on communications with Jim and they're not appropriate to send to the full district. If we were to send information out to the full district every time we have an incident that we address with kids around um, school safety or hate speech, we'd be sending messages out with frequency, which wouldn't be good for our students. And so a lot of care and consideration went into this policy. And if we were to change it, there's a huge process that needs to take place, including a hearing and, and, and notice to the community. And um, so it's not as simplistic as saying, okay, we can do this differently starting tomorrow. I also would be concerned that I would be sending something to someone outside of this and who, and it's not about you, Lisa, but it's about sending a message out to someone who, does, who is not a parent in a particular building who would be sharing it out on behalf of the school community for us when that's not what the protocol looks like here. So it would, if, if we felt like, or the board felt like there would be a layer where the town would need to know so they could push something out, then we would be pushing the message out ourselves because it would need to come from us. It can't, there can't be a conduit like that. So, you know, we'd really have to talk about it. Um, but, you know, sometimes what happens with students is that they make mistakes and, and parents feel like they want to know because of their own needs and not necessarily the needs associated with the children who um, need need to have a course correction and it creates a dynamic that we don't want for our kids. And so this is why this was very carefully considered and it's been reviewed every year and um, we haven't made an adjustment to it. And, you know, we have a quarterly reporting system that we, we exercise at the board meetings as a way to offset um, the concerns that not everyone would be notified when something happens so that the board can keep track of, of these incidents in a way that they felt was appropriate based on the fact that we're working with children. So, uh, you know, I went to the, um, I was right here last week where we had that joint presentation um, with Stephen Goldberg and he suggested, because it was brought up that incident at the Bell Playground that the appropriate notification conduit for the community is the police blotter, which is why Jim's comment is um, right in line with what his perception is, is the appropriate way of sharing out information like that with, with the larger community. But do you so. share that with Jim then, and then he can share that with us, or it's not something you share? Well, we had a, the police did yeah, an investigation we, we, on we, that. We took the report out, sure. So is it something that you would... We didn't, no, we didn't corroborate on, on, on her message. We do that right. on a bigger, much bigger picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, okay. I can certainly... I appreciate share. that comment, Christine, you just made about mm -hmm. sometimes it's not in the best interest, you can say it like this, the child is more for the parent to do whatever they want to do with it, good or bad. And that is a very fair statement. I, I just want to say something, having been on, on both sides of this, and I'm being a little quiet here, but I, I, I see the difference between having been on the school board. The school is very student-focused. It's a child-focused you know, perspective, as it should be. Whereas if you're not working with the school district, you've got a more of an adult-focused perspective. And, and you're looking at the adult interests, which are valid as well. But I think it's important for us to ask ourselves, if we want a certain kind of information, why do we want it? And what will we do with it? And who, whose interests are being served by those questions is gonna be different because every incident is different, perpetrated by different children at different ages. And so it's, it's not a one size fits all. It's a complicated problem. I'm not so much concerned about in school issues with students. I don't actually think that's like any of my business. I think mm -hmm. in terms of a student making a mistake in the school district and the principal or whoever needing to handle it, I'm more focused on like safety issues and making sure that whatever's happening, we're not kind of, if it's something serious, we also have the information because it's, you know, some people in this building that have to respond to that. And also we are gonna get calls. From, from community members. What's going on? We saw lights, we saw sirens. So in t I just want to be clear about what I'm asking. In terms of your you know, policy and your code of conduct and all that, I'm not asking you to revise the policy. I think in school matters need to be handled in school. It's not my place, I'm not on the board of ed. But I'm more thinking like bigger picture in terms of safety and, and making sure that our messages are aligned. And if there are things that are rising to a certain level where our police department needs to be involved. I think we should know that they're going on too. That's all. You're Making right. sure that whatever 
But it sounds like it is. But, yes. but, but I'm just letting you know that I'm hearing from parents, let's say it's Seven Bridges, say, who are very upset about what happened, that they're not notified, and it's something they actually want to speak to their children but, but, about. But, but I, it's not because of their morbid curiosity. I would because, just say the response to Well, I want to finish talking. Yeah. But, but that, well, that's why I'm bringing it up, is that I'm hearing from the parents what's happening here. We want to talk to our kids about it. My child is very upset because they're hearing through the grapevine about what happened, and we don't have appropriate messaging as to what actually happened. But I, and I, they're I, all the I same. I think it is appropriate in that time, though, to, to point them back to the board. To, to, and to I, do, yeah, I do. I don't think it is appropriate for you guys, because as you said, it didn't happen under your you know, watch, and it's mm -hmm. not your department, so to speak. So I think in those moments when people, parents call you, you know, they're, they send them to, our, send them to us. I do, I do. And, but well, also, again, I mean, as I said, people don't always understand that I'm constantly that. sending them to you guys. I know, but I but think I, I need to let you know that this helpful. is what I'm hearing. Right. But right. Because I do only get the it. And we hear, too, why didn't you tell? I mean, th this yeah. isn't news. Right. That yeah. Everybody wants to know everything that's going on everywhere because it might be interesting that, to them. Right, and um, that information is accessible to them. There, there's an element of people, I mean, we deal with this all the time. People are complaining to you to complain and to hear themselves speak. There's a easy line of a kid, kid goes your kid goes to seven bridges and something happened at bell you make one phone call you can find out they don't need to be calling you so i mean i i think our messaging here jeremy said okay. and as christine reiterated it's like we from the seat that we sit in we have to protect the students mm -hmm. and i'm not really interested in the gossip that that women or men of the town really need to get their hands on that's, but it's also protecting students who may feel discriminated against not just the ones who perpetrated so oh, yes. uh, yeah I, i'm sensitive to that as well mm -hmm. trust me so we I, know there are people who disagree with how we do this and we revisit it every year and it's tricky like i'm not going to say that it's like a clear-cut answer but it is something we look at every year and i think that at this juncture the best thing is send them to us and yeah i mean i Mm -hmm. Ironically, if we get messaging that we then give the parents, I think it would confuse the roles even further. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think we'd be de totally defeating the purpose and possibly saying the wrong things anyhow. Yeah, I, I think yeah. the dissemination of that information rightly belongs to the district. I, I just want to go back. So there are times where Jim and I have to like work on statements together. So those would be good statements for him to share with you because I'm mentioning the town of Newcastle police in them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I think so. Okay. Thank you. So when they're finalized, Jim could just push it. Exactly. Right. Perfect. Okay. And then the last thing on our agenda was student parking. Oh yeah, that's me. <laughs> so I I've been trying to work with Chappaqua Crossing. I've asked them like 20 different times if we could lease spaces from them for juniors and they, they keep um telling me they're not interested, but I didn't know, do you have spaces that we can lease from, from you that I could monitor to get junior parking over there? Because there's a whole huge lot that no one parks in during the day. And I think it would solve a whole bunch of problems for us, for Chappaqua Crossing. It might be a way to like support you in some way, because I could just charge the kids for the spots. Is there some way to, is there some, is there an option? So I've actually spoken also to Chappaqua Crossing and asked them if they would be interested in that, and they are not. And it's privately owned property. Even by Chappaqua, like that whole area back there? Because we share that <laughs> part. That's like a shared parking. Lisa, so, in your conversations, have they said why? Have they identified the, the problems they would have? That it's their private property, and they I mean, don't want obvious. students <laughs> parking there. Oh, okay. And you but know, there's enough stop. students who are there all the time, going to there, Starbucks and everything there. else. Yeah. They 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 want the parking for the 91 townhomes that are going to be in there, for the gym, for Whole Foods, for those in the in the Cupola building and the office buildings. They don't want to use their parking spaces for juniors to be parking on campus we, on we their actually, private so property. Essentially, they anticipate. Uh, parking spaces will be used. Mm -hmm. Sure, I guess. So that's, that would be most And if they're not, they just don't. Well, that, I'm not trying to get to what the yeah, real reason. And much and like you know, I can't. Right, and much like I can't park, say they, they need to park, park um, demand that they park in your driveway. We can't demand that they park there. Well, either. I think we all know that, but what, I'm just trying to figure out what the issues are. We 
We just didn't company. know if it's that like cat pack piece of it was it's separate. It's not. It's from shared parking, and we have we have strict requirements. I've been working on this for how long? How much spot you need? Arguably, why do juniors have to park on campus? I thought it was like nice to have it as a as this privilege for seniors to park I think on it's campus. insane and it's just because we're on a main road I drove to school as soon as I had a license because you could like we didn't have a parking issue it was only seniors oh, no. how many spots do you think that you need I don't know I mean, maybe we'd start the year with 50 and then we'd need probably 100 something but I was ready to every time he calls me and complains I, I shoot back the well, Lisa space will leave spaces from you, and then I thought maybe you had spaces over by the chat pack, but you don't. Mm -hmm. so, you can no. build a parking structure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Only seniors, yeah. the juniors could only park there during kind of senior experience yeah, when is. they would trade parking permits. I'm looking for. I don't know about that part, but I'm looking for. An, I was just looking for an alternative for kids and trying to solve a concern that they continue to bring my attention, and mm -hmm. I have to keep saying that those aren't our spaces. You built next to a high school. We'll make announcements, but I, I, mm -hmm. I say to him, a different way to do this is give us some spots. I'll monitor it. We'll pay for it. We'll put cameras out there, and it'll solve your problem and it'll solve an issue for us. But they're just not interested. Mm -hmm. um, maybe so, once the townhouses are built and they see what the usage actually is. Yes, yeah, maybe. I mean, I will say that the you know a lot of the kids park at Lifetime, and that parking lot's pretty crowded. They and shut that down though. The first day of school, know, lifetime was like tickets. giving out tickets. So I, there are no kids parking there now. They but I know that's really, but that lot's pretty crowded. Not I'm not saying with kids. I, I think just they don't hey, the they don't want that. They want right. their spots utilized by their tenants. Right. No, I, but I think the spots that Christine was talking about are way it's in the back. It's, it's it's that like, the like by the doctor's yeah. office, but like the above lot where yeah. it's just it's basically no one's parking. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very far. But the kids would do it. With, <laughs> the kids would walk. <laughs> Summit Greenfield about how those parking spots are utilized and we're not allowed to okay. have anyone else park there. Maybe we could talk to them about that lot though, because nobody's a chat pack during the day. I have, I have sometimes they are. Have a sometimes there's programming, <laughs> but they want they want those I'm spots in general. So we're limited to the amount of spots we're allowed to use during the day there. Because they want those to be able to use them by their during the day. The traps. Okay, that was my that was my only agenda item. If you have a car for a lifetime, right? Here for a lifetime, I'm going to use your park there. That's a good idea. Okay, so I'm going to get back to you on Thursday about just to kind of about the next a work session possibility around the uh, tap line and about the sign because mm -hmm. we have a meeting tomorrow so we can talk about it then. okay perfect and then certainly i want to i personally would love to you know have these meetings like once a quarter to just talk about whatever issues we may be seeing whatever you are and how we can just work collaboratively together as a community so if there are issues you want to discuss i feel like this should be something that should happen quarterly well, we can talk about that, okay? Thank you so right. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks for having us. And again, um, Christine, make sure you also send us that letter for advocacy for the okay. tax cap. I don't have it written yet. No, no, when you have it. When you have it. Believe me, we want because every all the help we can get. And I will forward that, that as well to the, um, it doesn't need to be that. It can be our version of it to all of the town Thank supervisors you. in the city of Montana. Because kids can be very separate. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We can do it. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Sorry. It's so cool watching you on there. All right. Good luck with your fun. Hey, Karen. We have to go like yours. Oh, thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Oh, in here? Okay. Yes. So um, can we just have a recess? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we're going to take a five.